Wonderful. Thank you so much for this nice introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here actually today. And uh, I would like to thank for sure uh, the Korea Jewelry Promotion Foundation and also the Seoul Jewelry Industry Center for this invitation. I'm very honored to be here today. Um, today, we start with the presentation, Freigeben. So today I would like to uh, show you the beauty, the beauty of science. Maybe we start with the beauty of gemstones. I mean, gemstones are beautiful. And what I want to show you is that the science behind gemstones is beautiful too. I mean, specifically as we are testing um, some of the most important and prestigious gems and jewelry offered today in the market. But before we start with cases, I would like to introduce to you the Swiss Gem Institute, SSEF. SSEF is an acronym. It stands for the Swiss Foundation for the Research of Gemstones. So we are a foundation uh, nearly 50 years ago, has been founded by Swiss trade organizations and we are as such a non-profit organization serving the trade in uh, all aspects in Switzerland and internationally. And we have a lot of research as it is part of our uh, foundation, which means also a lot of collaborations worldwide. Uh, we are located in Basel, so for those who know Europe and even Switzerland, uh, you're welcome to visit this nice but rather small city in Switzerland. Um, SSF has several, uh, let's say, parts. We are working uh, and testing gemstones, loose or set, color stones, diamonds and pearls. But then we have an important branch, which is about education. So we run many courses on all levels where you can learn uh, from basic level up to scientific level, even for other labs, how to test uh, gemstones and pearls and how to understand this material fully. We have for sure then the research and development branch where we are uh, doing research on topics related to the trade, new treatments coming, new origins coming into the market. And we also develop instruments specifically for labs, but also even for the trade. And finally, we are uh, consulting organizations like uh, CIPJO, ICA, uh, LMHC, and so on, specifically on nomenclature or on disclosure issues, how to disclose a treatment or a synthetic material uh, in the trade. So that's what we cover at SSF. For sure, course programs are something which are uh, important for us because we want to have the consumer finally even, but also the trade educated. So for those interested in courses, I suggest you also to have a look on our website where we have free online courses on specific stones like diamonds, uh, rubies, sapphires, emeralds, pearls, and more to come as uh, quite a broad and deep uh, information on all these stones. But finally, the most important for sure is gemstone testing, I mean, color stone testing, diamonds and pearls as a service for the trade. And uh, this is also how finally we gain our money because we are not funded by the government or by any kind of uh, private, whatever, but we have to work uh, through this service and to gain our uh, money for the lab. Okay. I just start with a few items 
exceptional items just to show you the range of materials we see and also the beauty and the exceptional quality. So uh, to start with this jadeite necklace, you probably have heard this is a jadeite necklace of historic provenance, which has sold in Hong Kong in 2014 for a stunning price, but also the material is stunning and it's absolutely beautiful as you see on this photo. On the sunrise ruby, you see a chemical analysis on the right. So this is uh, has been sold at Sotheby's in Geneva from uh, 30, 000, 30 million uh, dollars. And you see the stone of exceptional quality. Or here we have a cashmere sapphire, which actually is uh, very exceptional, not only in size, but and color, but also as we were able, and I'm coming back to this later, to do age dating on this stone. So provide a geologic history of this material. Here we have a very exceptional uh, fancy pink diamond of, as you see, 100 carats. So uh, this is also one of the stones we have tested in recent years and SSF, just it shows you the range and uh, beauty of these stones. And to finish here, the pearl pendant of Marie Antoinette, which was sold in Sotheby's again in Geneva uh, quite recently for a very uh, exceptional price. It was connected to the beauty of the item, but definitely also to the history and provenance it has. And you see a radiography of that same pearl just beside done at SSF. So this is just to show you the uh, items we see uh, at SF and the high-end quality, which is a pleasure and the, uh, to see this beauty and to work with it. Now I would like to focus today on two uh, topics mainly. Uh, one is about nomenclature, let's say identification of uh, uh, corundum varieties, finally, and Later, we will talk about origin determination of corundum. Uh, to start with, when we talk about gemstones, color stones, we first talk about the mineral. And the mineral has a name which is well defined scientifically. And it is very clear this is a diamond. Here we talk about a corundum or a beryl. These names are defined internationally and we can analyze stone by classic methods or advanced and we identify the mineral. More difficult, however, is the attribution to a gem variety. Is it now a ruby, which is the red variety of corundum, or is it a pink sapphire, which is just a pink variety of sapphire, of corundum? And we have to say, these variety names are not well defined at least not scientifically. Usually they are linked to the chemistry, or the visual color, let's say. Uh, they may be defined historically. Uh, truth is, consumers mostly know the variety name. They know ruby, but they have no idea that sapphire in fact is the same. It's just a different color of corundum. So in a lab situation, we have to deal with these nomenclature issues to be consistent over time. And uh, this consistency, I want to show uh, here with mm, some examples. And it starts with the question ruby and pink sapphire. In fact, the separation between these two color varieties of corundum is only based on the color saturation which means you just look at the stone and now it's red, saturated red, or it's just pink. The point is that we talk here about a grading system somehow similar to diamonds, where we have colorless diamonds, and we just add a U of normally yellowish, and we get from D to whatever grade you have. And here we have two categories and a separation. The Point is, in colors and color stones, we talk about a three-dimensional color space because we don't have only saturation, but we may have also a color U going more to a 
purple, bluish color. So we have a more complex situation. At ACSF, we use a master set of stones, as you see it here, which has been produced by the International Color Association in the 80s. So many decades ago, still very useful as we can just compare a stone with these master stones and tell the difference. Interestingly, for sapphires, there is much less of a strict separation. Whether it's a dark blue uh, corundum or a very light blue stone, this is all considered sapphire. If we have very light grayish blue colors, we would switch at SSF to a term called fancy sapphire. Or if there is no color at all anymore, we are now talking about the colorless sapphire. But we see already here the, di the difference between these uh, uh, variety names and separations. And it's very important to fix as much as possible the limits specifically for the labs, but finally also for the trade. And to add on this, uh, we enter the most complex variety of a corundum, which is for sure Patparacha, because Patparacha is actually, again, not just a range of saturations, but it's a very, um, let's say, range of colors, which all have to be subtle, a mix between pink and orange. And the circle should show you uh, the limit of Patparacha. And when I go to the right side, I'm talking about pink. If I'm on the left side, I'm talking about orange sapphires. And on the top, I have sapphires of beautiful, fancy color. So too much saturated to be called Patparacha. Again, here we have a separation based on color. Uh, what we can say is beryllium diffusion treatment has to be excluded to be called Patparacha. But the complexity is not so easy. Here we have a sample which looks somehow orangey pink. There is an orange tint to it, so visually it might look like a patparaccia. It is, however, not, because the color, the orange color, comes from an inclusion. It comes from iron hydroxide or rust, which naturally is present in this stone, in a fissure, as you can see in the micro uh, photos, and the color of the stone alone is just pink. So this would not be a uh, patparaccia, although the color first looks quite similar. Or then we go to the next situation, and I hope it works, which is a sapphire, it's a pink sapphire you got in the lab, and the client claimed it to be patparaccia. So difficult to understand. In fact, this stone is not stable in its color. By a short uh, illumination with a UV lamp, we have switched the same stone to a distinctly orangey color, and we can switch it back to pink just by exposure to a light, let's say, even in the window a display of a, a jewelry shop, the stone would switch back. Again, here we cannot talk about the Patparaccia. This is a stone which is interesting, even beautiful, but it shows a change of color. And for those who are interested in this topic, uh, there is a publication which was uh, done uh, three years ago, uh, giving full details about this process and these uh, specific stones. So this is concerning nomenclature. And I want to switch over now to origin determination as we at SSF are very much involved. And this is one of the main services we provide to the trade for colored stones. So where does the stone come from has an influence on, uh, let's say the emotion and finally on the pricing of a stone. And uh, as a lab, it's our task to provide an uh, expert opinion about the origin. What you see here is a, a sunset at Mogok, a very beautiful area, which historically, since many centuries, is the source of some of the most 
uh, exceptional rubies, sapphires, and other gemstones in the market. And here you see a world map with some of the most uh, productive mining areas. And in blue, for sure, it's sapphires. And in red, you see ruby uh, sources. And we will go into uh, sapphires and we will have a look specifically to Kashmir. Why are these gemstone deposits uh, formed or how they are formed? It's all linked to large scale uh, uh, geological uh, events. Let's say the collision of India with Eurasia, which has produced finally the Himalaya mountain range and as a byproduct at the same time has transformed all the rocks and has formed many gemstones, rubies, sapphires in, in Myanmar, Kashmir, and so on. So this is explaining also the distribution, for example, along the Himalayan range of all these sources. For a lab providing uh, origin detonation as a service, it's very crucial and important to have reference collection and uh, reference stones from single uh, uh, sources and to visit also these mines to get a geological um, to investigate the geological formation processes leading to the formation of gemstones. And what you see here are photos I have taken from Mokok again, where you see uh, here the Baba a sapphire mine, the largest producing sapphire mine currently in Mokok. Uh, and again, a very uh, beautiful scenery actually. Let's talk about Kashmir as uh, the source uh, of, let's say, the normally most appreciated and highly priced material in the market. To be very clear, Kashmir is a source which has provided all qualities of sapphires. You find superb, beautiful stones of excellent quality. You find also very low quality stones. So an origin is not and it's not a quality by itself. Very uh, interestingly, the Kashmir mine was only very short time productive by the end of the 19th century. And since today, there is nearly no new material coming. So whatever is in the market mostly is repolished again and again. So these are old stones. There is only a limited quality, uh, quantity available, which is on top of their beauty of some of these stones driving their value and price. Interestingly, Kashmir sapphires have small, subtle and beautiful inclusions. What you see here are uh, kind of two very exceptional Kashmir sapphires sold at auction and inclusions which are very telling for this source. And it's part of the beauty to work with these stones, to work with a microscope, to look inside and to see the beauty, but to learn much more about the inclusions because they tell us a lot how they formed and where they formed. Or here we have a very uh, characteristic inclusion again for Kashmir Sapphire. It's a parkosite, which is an amphibole, magnesium amphibole, in sapphire from Kashmir. So seeing such an inclusion is already telling us very much that this is a uh, Kashmir sapphire. However, stones which show a similar velvety, say, uh, beautiful blue color are known from different other sources also. And the most, uh, uh, let's say, most well-known source of such stones in recent year is Madagascar. So what you see on the left, this ring shows you a superb Madagascar stone, uh, which a very similar color appearance as you would expect from the best quality of cashmere. So this is another uh, important topic to see. Beauty is not linked to an origin. 
you can find the best quality in, in Madagascar or in Kashmir or other places. And at some point, I would even suggest to buy a stone on beauty and not just on a label of an origin. And what we see now in these smaller micro photos are just uh, showing you different features, let's say similar features, but they are slightly different between stones from Kashmir and stones from Madagascar. So again, microscopy is a very beautiful approach and classic approach is very helpful. It's much more helpful than many other advanced technologies because these inclusions actually represent the host rock in which the sapphire formed and these host rocks in Madagascar and in Kashmir were different. However, we need to go further and we want to analyze stones with advanced technology. And what you see here is actually on the left, two so-called Raman spectra. Raman spectroscopy is a method where you excite molecules in a substance to vibrate. And this vibration you can register in a spectrum. And these two spectra show inclusions in a gemstone within the stone. We can go with a, with a laser inside the stone without any uh, destructive uh, testing. We just focus with a microscope and we analyze the vibration in this circon inclusion. And we see a difference in the circons, which are often found in Kashmir sapphires to circons found in Madagascar sapphires. So this is a, a very good direction and uh, scientific proof. If we have a stone, we analyze the circon and we can get information about its origin. And on the right side, you see a trade alert, which uh, we published uh, about four years ago, because at some point a new source was found and Kashmir-like material entered the market in quantity and was finally sold as Kashmir uh, to some extent. And we had to say, stop, be careful. This is Madagascar stones. So you can find all this with the link here also on our website for those who are interested. By using this Raman spectroscopy, we can not only say something about Kashmir or Madagascar, we also can have a look on what is about Burmese sapphires compared to Sri Lankan stones. So this is a tool which has been, uh, which is applied since many years at SSF and we have published about this a scientific article uh, in collaboration with the Gubelin Gem Lab uh, just very recently. So for those interested, please have a look in this. So analysis of inclusions is very important and analysis of chemical composition is also very important. Whatever we produce as an opinion of an origin is based on a combination of microscopic observations and data acquired with advanced technology, whether it's now trace element composition, molecular vibration or absorption behavior. And here you see just uh, uh, an option to analyze trace elements at very low uh, limits of detection with a so, uh, mass spectrometer. And the specific instrument we use at SSF and is a uh, time of flight mass spectrometer, which provides you all elements present in a gemstone at the same moment, just at once. It's like a snapshot. And you see the complexity, all these lines and peaks you see are in fact related to isotopes of elements. And we can calculate out of this then trace element composition and we can plot them into plots. And what you see here in these plots is first a three-dimensional plot of vanadium, magnesium, and gallium as trace elements, and in blue, the Kashmir cloud of sapphire. So it's quite a located cloud. But if we start to include other sources, we have to say from the trace elements, there is a certain overlapping. So trace elements are helpful and good, but it's not like a black box and you put the stone inside and you know the origin. This is way 
too simplified. We need to have additional data from other sources, whether it's our Raman spectra or inclusions, but still it's very helpful. So this data for sure, there is a lot of data because we have more than 50 elements we measure and we measure on every stone's uh, uh, a time period and a certain uh, amount of spots. This data can be worked with statistical methods. And uh, what we see here is finally from just a pure elemental distribution, magnesium to gallium, to uh, uh, principal component statistical methods, and what we use actually this is, is a form of uh, artificial intelligence is machine learning so the machine actually takes all the data and it tries to find uh, the closest matches and it creates uh, it's a uh, so-called unsupervised clouds of data so the Kashmir and uh, uh, the madagascar data you can kind of separate it also in the beginning it was overlapping another approach is to have a look on the age of the stone now this is something which we can only provide do on stones which have an inclusion like zircon rutile appetite which is at the surface if this is the case we apply age dating and we don't even charge the client we just do it and this age dating provides us an information as, for example, here, a stone uh, from Sri Lanka, which has an age of about 560 million years. So this age fits very well with the geological formation of sapphires in Sri Lanka uh, during a pan-African uh, metamorphic event. Or we have an age, as for this, 22 carats uh, Kashmir sapphire of 25 million years, much younger. Geologically spoken, this is the age of the Himalaya mountain range formation. So India pushing into Eurasia. So by, I didn't, by, by uh, measuring, calculating the age of a stone of unknown origin, we can sort out, is it now Sri Lankan? or is it Kashmir? Now, age dating is anyhow a very interesting topic, and we apply it also on organic matter. And here we have access using age dating uh, with carbon or radiocarbon, the same as has been applied, for example, on mummies from Egypt. So this method is uh, easily uh, applicable on pearls because they contain a lot of carbon. It's the main element of their uh, structure. And we take just very few milligrams from the drill hole. And we have here a, a necklace where we have analyzed uh, a selection of pearls. And this necklace has a provided uh, historical provenance. And yes, we can prove the age is historic. We talk about the uh, uh, 16th to 18th century. These age dating methods normally are not so precise. You cannot tell a day, but at least we can say this is definitely not new pearls found just very recently. This is historic and it fits very well with the provided documentation. So it's valuable for the high end pearl trade to do this. And at some point, it's also important to know the DNA, to know finally the species, whether it's now a question of CITES where you cannot export or import corals based on CITES protection, or whether it's just to, to find out more about a specific pearl or ivory, where does it come from? What is the animal it produced originally? We are able to provide this service to the trade by using very tiny amounts of milligrams of material. So as an example here, this Corallium japonicum coral necklace. You find all and many much more information about this on our website. And I invite you to have a look there and to get informed about what is possible today with all these methods. And with this picture, I'm nearly at the end. Uh, at the very end, we talk about beautiful stones. They are very important to always understand there are people behind this. 
And it's very important to protect and support these peoples where, wherever they are. And we try our best to support them with our work, with our daily work in the lab. So with this, I want to finish. Um, thank you for your attention. I hope you have some questions. It will be a pleasure to answer your questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me uh, get some questions. Okay. Uh, about the color separations on rubies, and then mm -hmm. uh, you uh, showed that you're using a master rubies only, master, right? But is it really scientific separation? Because some, how can you really divide day and night? This is ruby and this is fancy. Just some, some colors are not even. Exactly, exactly. I mean, exactly, this is the point. I mean, if you talk about diamonds, we have a stone which is isotropic, so has no pleochroism, which is normally cut in ideal proportions, normally has no inclusions and now no color zoning. So I, I would say it's quite straightforward to go through. If we talk about the color stone, usually you have a problem of the cutting style, window situation, you have a problem of inclusions, color zoning, and pleochroism. So this is a problem where I have to say this, you cannot just simplify it on, uh, I mean, we measure the color, but we have to say this is always a, a tool which has limitations. And the best today still is to have a look visually on the stones. And nature, unfortunately, provides the full range from red to pink. But at some point, we have to set a limit. And the best still is to use a master stone. There is no way to attach it, for example, to the chromium concentration. The chromium gives the red color. So we cannot just say at this level of chromium, it's pink and that is because, as I said, these stones are zoned very often and you may have even no chromium at the surface but a lot of chromium below the surface and the color is deep red. So a measurement of the chromium is not, would not be scientific at all. So still we have to rely on the master, master stones. All the, all labs do, exactly. Color stones, this is still the, the best. So yeah. the same, uh, same uh, applies to the sapphires as well for the all the master stones? Yes, absolutely. You have seen master stones, exactly. These were master stones at SSF. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is one quick question about, you showed the paparazzi changing color. It was um, not paparazzi, but you said one, uh, one light is a pink, the other light is uh, orange. So can you call that color change paparazzi? No, <laughs> a color change is finally you, uh, used as a term for material when you just have two different light sources and I switch from one to the next, let's say candlelight to daylight and I see immediately a different color. What we have here is rather a situation like somehow like chameleon diamonds. So it's a situation which has to do with a color center which you can activate or deactivate over time by exposure to a lamp. So this is a different process and so should not be called a color change, uh, whatever, patparaccia. Um, because it's a very different uh, property, which we see here. So we just as a standard, and also this is based then on LMHC and all uh, these uh, labs attached to it, would not uh, call this a patparaccia, because as you buy a patparaccia for a very high price, you expect to be able to give this stone to your daughter in 20, 30 years with the same color. But if it's just pink, something has happened. I see. Thank you for, the, for your explanation. Uh, yes. About uh, Kashmir and Madagascar sapphires, uh, I, I think you're, uh, you're testing uh, using uh, several methods uh, to 
identify the origins. And mm -hmm. is it, I mean, is it like impossible cases that is impossible to... Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Again, we are finally always giving an opinion uh, of an origin because we have not been with the stone and we have not seen the stone coming from, from the ground. So it is possible that we have stones which are showing uh, features, let's say microscopic features fitting with Kashmir, but all the analytical data is not fitting. So in such a situation, we do not express an opinion on the report. We will write a letter together with this uh, report where we state why we cannot. And to explain that in this is the situation at the moment, it might even be that in 10 years we can do. Because science is going forward every year and this is just at the moment not possible to provide an origin for a stone. Oh, okay. So, I mean, the question was like, um, can you, uh, could you please say about what percentage that you cannot? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not so easy. I just can say, first of all, rubies uh, and emeralds, it's, it's very small amounts. Most of the rubies and sapphires, we can clearly uh, indicate an origin. However, for sapphires, the, the situation is much more complex. I would say about 5% of the stones uh, we don't give an opinion, expert opinion. I see. Another important point is to understand origin determination is something where experts of one lab will give an opinion, and it might be that another lab gives another opinion. And I would not dare to say that there is a mistake because it's like in other fields, like in paintings or in the medicine, that different doctors or different experts may have well-founded different opinion on something. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, we know that uh, one question is this one. Um, there are low temperature treated Mozambique rubies, right? And then mm -hmm. they, uh, low temperature treated Mas Madagascarian sapphires cause the same problems? Is yes, I mean... You see, uh, when we talk about heat treatment of corundum, classically we speak about temperatures about uh, 1,200, 1,400 degrees or even more, which have an influence on the inclusions. They transform by this process and it's rather straightforward to detect and to, to recognize this. Now, when we come from the lower end and say, okay, we use now 800 degrees or even less, the problem is that most features on, let's say, most inclusions are not changing. So the microscopic aspect, which is still very important, is not helpful. And now we have to use technology. We use infrared spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy, uh, basically trying to, uh, to register the molecular vibrations of this material. And uh, at some point, we have to say, we uh, learn more and more over the years and the low temperature heating of a corundum is something which only in the last uh, four or five years, we think we have the tools to analyze it. Beforehand, there was on our labs, there was a difficulty to detect this treatment. We have published in 2018, I think, a press release about this. And we have, we always, I mean, that's the policy of SSF, we always provide the, data and also the, the, the criteria. So you see the spectra on which we, which we use in infrared spectroscopy to separate low temperature heated, uh, whether it's sapphires or rubies, doesn't matter, uh, from un, uh, stones which have no indication of heating. Yeah. I see, thank you. Um, another question is about uh, color stability. Um, mm -hmm. When, um, when the stone is uh, for color stability is tested. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a test which we apply since many, many years on all yellow sapphires or orange sapphires. It is a test which is very simple. 
And since now about five years, we also applied on all Potpurachas. For sure, the client have to agree. So we will call or we will, uh, write an email asking that he agrees that we carry out this so uh, stability test. The test itself is very simple, can be done even by the trader himself, herself. It is, first of all, a test where you expose a stone, which has a kind of a potbaracha color, uh, to a strong light source for three hours. We use a fiber optic lamp and we place a stone about five centimeters in front of the light, very close. So this is a time for relaxing uh, or uh, deactivating a color center and the stone could turn to become pink. Uh, so we know the first color is now pink. That's a stable color because it's related to chromium. And now I can try to activate the color center again. And we do regularly by using a UV lamp, long wave UV lamp. We place the stone even on the lamp and we wait 10 minutes. So in about three and a half hours, you know. Now we have activated and the stone may be orange, as you have seen in this ring. That was exactly this process we went through. And you can go back and forth. Just now, when it's orange, you put it again three hours in front of the lamp. So what we do normally is we get a stone, we will send it back in the same color. So we can bring it back to the same color, but still in very rare cases, I cannot remember one, but it might be that we cannot bring back the color. So that's why we have to ask the client, are you, do you agree? Let's see. If he doesn't agree, which is okay, then there will be a comment that the color was not tested, the stability of the color was not tested. It's actually a standard produce, produce, uh, production that now for all labs I know of. I mean, uh, this is something where the trade knows and they will normally agree to do the stability test because at the very end, it's in their interest. If they sell a very expensive potparacha to a client and the client comes back with a pink stone after two months, they have a problem. So Better to know first. Only one stone, one case that, that the color did not come back after it's... it's uh... I don't remember, no, because actually we have seen uh, lots of stones and we were always able to go back and forth. No problem. Let's see. Is there any case that uh, permanently stayed the color, I mean, color changed under UV permanently? Is there any chance that color can be changed to a different color under UV exposure. I mean, we talk about shades now for of yellow. So it might be that the stone cannot be activated anymore. So the stable color pink remains and then it's a pink sapphire. It's not, there is not, uh, let's say, uh, uh, there, it's not without any value anymore because the stone is still beautiful, but it doesn't have this orangey tint anymore. But it's not like you get a colorless stone back because the chromium is always there. <laughs> yes, okay, thank you. Uh, this question is about the age date dating question. Uh, it's about Demtoff testing. Is it mm -hmm. destructive testing or is it there's no harm done to the stones or to? Let it put like this, there is no harm done to the stone because what we do still is we a blade, we take a very tiny amount of the stone normally at the girdle, so you hardly see it. The, the spot which we use for taking uh, corundum uh, particles has the diameter of a hair. So it's super small spot, which you see with a loop, yes, but which have no influence on the weight of the stone whatsoever. I mean, we weight the stone with three digits after the comma, and it is still exactly the same weight. So it's not, no, it's not destructive at all, but it's, we call this uh, uh, finally semi or quasi non-destructive, we call it, yes, quasi non-destructive. We, we need to take it. Okay. But is it uh, then smaller size than the one that you do LA ICP test on the... Uh... It's similar. 
it's very similar. You know, laser ablation is the method is find it just to get the particle out of the stone and you just can change the diameter of the laser spot. So some use a large spot, some use a smaller spot. We use a smaller spot and others will use a larger spot, but at the very end, it's, it's very same. Yeah. I see, thank you. Oh, one last question um, mm -hmm. is about um, in, in your experience, I'm no, I know I've uh, seen so many gemstones. Mm -hmm. uh, which stone is the most memorable one for you? Uh, I know. Very difficult because we have seen so many exception stones. I think stones which, which have a history, which is documented over centuries, are personally for me uh, some of the most interesting cases. So I remember, uh, uh, for example, from, uh, from uh, a setting with pink topaz from Wittelsbach. So this is a, a German a royal family, and this was done in the 19th century uh, for his daughters. He provided several sets of, uh, of tiaras and necklace and so on. And to see the history of this item, to see the beauty of these stones, this is a combination which is, is something of the most beautiful. I have ever seen. But then I have to say, I mean, I'm working since 20, more than 20 years at SSF, and every day we see very exceptional stones. And I'm just uh, uh, fascinated by nature, what kind of beauty is produced by nature. And we are happy to work with these stones. I'm sure you will see many more beautiful stones. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for your presentation, Michael. And then, uh, and I know you joined us uh, in early hours, uh, your time. So thank you for your time again. And uh, hopefully we can meet you all in real, right? In person in the near future. Exactly. Soon, I hope to. Yes. Hope you my great pleasure. So, and give, uh, give the presentation in person. Thank you. I will do. <laughs> Great pleasure.